Hey all, welcome in. I'm Rad and this is my hardcore world. Let's jump straight into this. Last time I ended by saying we were building a roller coaster, but we're not. How dare you? At least not today. Hold on, I need to realize that my double chest of observers is all gone. I guess I need quartz. Where was I? So after I recorded the last video, I really thought about my feelings on Minecraft. I said I forgot how to play and just have fun, but beyond that, planning a series this in depth and this over the top means I know months in advance what I'm gonna do and a rough guide as to when. This is how my brain works. I need to know what's coming so I don't stress over it, but at the same time, all I can see some days is the insane amount of work to get there. What you don't see in that planning document is the time. Time to finish the city the way that I want is probably another 600 hours of recording, if not more. That's not including creative planning, editing, or doing any post-production work, uploading, answering every comment as I always do, so when I see something that I want to do, like the map wall, it feels like I'm simply adding more work to an already full plate. How does that relate to today? Well, when I thought about what I really truly wanted, the answer was to finish the entire perimeter and decoration. I know this project has another 100 or more hours of work left, and I don't want to drag it out another 5 episodes. So that's what we're going to do today. I need observers because we're building the largest redstone machine I've ever made to dig the largest hole I've ever made, which I'll fill with the largest pixel art I've ever made. And those are good times. This project begins on day 2480. That's significant to note, but for now, just hold on to it. The world eater I'm building today is going to destroy every block in the area down to the bedrock floor, so I need to move these shulkers that were used to build the trenchers, and I need to move my portal as well. Obsidian in the portal frame would stop the sweepers, as we'll discuss in a minute. I'm just going to move this portal up 100 or so blocks so it still connects to the exact same portal on the nether roof. And part of the trial chamber that I raided here is within the perimeter, and most of it's outside of it, so the part that's inside will be completely destroyed. Unfortunately, the vaults and spawners will stop the sweeper, so I need to remove those also. That gave me a chance to take on another round of these spawners as well. Both spawners and vaults can be mined, but it takes an exceptionally long time, far longer than even obsidian. Still, I do need to mine every one out. And with every geode in the area about to be obliterated, I collected amethyst clusters and shards as they were difficult to farm, and calcite because it's impossible to farm. Inside the perimeter, I also need to make sure no kelp is in the ocean bits. Kelp growing while the sweepers are running can cause issues, so I need to ensure every last kelp plant is gone. And something I did miss here, and we'll see it break the sweeper later, is the shipwrecks and drowned ruins that have stairs in them. TNT explodes stairs just fine. It doesn't explode waterlogged stairs at all, though. With our prep done, let's build a world eater and I'll explain how this works, at least the best I can. This world eater is built in three unique parts. The bottom are liquid removers that we'll call water sweepers, but really they'll remove water or lava that's within the area, and that means I don't need to drain hardly anything else for this project. There are a couple of areas where water and lava will get too close together, but we'll deal with that when it happens. Just remember, cobblestone good, obsidian bad. So that's the bottom of the machine. At the top are a set of over 100 flying machine TNT dupers that will do the bulk of the eating of the world. These will fly back and forth, dropping thousands and thousands and thousands of TNT, which should destroy absolutely everything that I don't manually remove. On either end is a return station. These serve the purpose of starting and stopping the machine, but more importantly, each time the flying machines get to one end, they let the TNT turn off, pause while the water sweepers get clear, and then lower the machine by one block, restart the TNT and the sweepers, all in order to ensure the sweepers don't get blown up by the falling TNT. It also means if one sweeper gets stuck, the whole machine doesn't break. The redstone wiring is done in a way that all sweepers need to be back before they will resend the machine. This is called an AND gate, because we need sweeper 1, AND sweeper 2, AND sweeper 3, and so on, to all be back before the redstone continues working. The sweepers are built now. You don't have to start these quite as high in the air as I did, but you do need them to clear every block in the perimeter, including the highest trees. I'd rather run it for a few extra minutes than have it immediately break on me. And yes, I'm 100% using Lightmatica for a build this complicated. These machines are intricate, detailed, and as we saw with the trenchers, will break if I look at them funny. Now it's time to build the TNT dupers. This will be pretty challenging, so I ended up building a runway of temporary blocks so I could reach everything as I went. Moss was definitely my best friend on this project. I disconnected these ones so nothing I do has any effect on the parts that are already built, just in case. Now let's build the world leader, but with less yapping. With the world leader now built, it's time to remove the moss temporary bridge and see how much I got wrong in the build. And then using Lightmatica's verify feature, I can check what's wrong. You can see I have a few pistons that I placed before the redstone block, and that's not going to work. Seems I did the same thing a few times. Then I completely forgot a slime block here. And then this note block starts the whole thing, so let's start the whole thing. I know this is safe, but it doesn't feel safe up here. Yeah, that's a fair bit of TNT. Let's watch this for a second. There's actually so much TNT falling that you can't see it all at the same time. Look as I fly down the line, you can see more and more rendering in. It's all there, it's all working. The game just can't process everything that's supposed to be on screen at the same time, so it doesn't. 
Yeah, that's a lot of TNT. And you can see why I put my portal here now. This is a nice bird's eye view of everything. Not that Minecraft has birds other than chickens and cave birds. During the world eating, you're going to see plenty of mobs. This is unusual since I often play the harder build stuff with the mob switch on, but in order to run the world eater without it breaking every 8 seconds, I'm recording one long replay mod and recording with my old cam account, like we used to do before replay mod was even a thing. Replay mod can glitch out, especially on long, long recordings, and this one's going to be over 11 hours long. So to ensure I have the footage and to keep the perimeter loaded, I've got my cam account in spectator at the very top of the world. But that means my mob switch doesn't work, so there's always a trade-off. I get the cam footage, I lose the mob switch. Fair enough. And look at this, we're actually down to breaking blocks now, let's go. I've used the world eater for a little while now. You can see most of the land is gone and we're down to stone and water. It's a lot of fun seeing the land being removed like this at these levels. And we did end up with our first stuck sweeper here. As I mentioned, I missed that waterlogged stairs wouldn't get destroyed by the TNT. Fixing it's pretty easy. You just break the obstruction and then restart the back observer. And there it goes, it's almost done. You can see the rest of the machine waiting for it because of that AND gate that I talked about before. Once it gets back, just keep an eye on it. And as it docks back home, you'll see the TNT will restart immediately and automatically. And for the life of me, I couldn't tell you why this one stopped. What, a stone block stopped it? Oh well, I removed it. Easy restart. Let's go. After fixing a few stoppages, the world eater ran for hours flawlessly. While the machine runs, you'll see me dart in and out to collect resources. Unlike the trenches, I didn't collect every possible ore. I simply collected amethyst clusters and diamond ore and a little bit of calcite. The rest I have enough of for now, and I don't want to be blowing up fully grown clusters if I can avoid it. You'll also see me fly in to remove obsidian. That's important because the sweepers will and do get stuck on that. Removing obsidian was by far the worst part of the world eating. Collecting diamonds was the best. I do have the texture pack on for this that I discussed in a previous episode where they show up a bit better. The world is a lot of chaos at the moment, so this helps me just a little bit. And this is by far the worst section of the perimeter. An area where a lot of water met a lot of lava, and that's just toxic. It formed a lot of obsidian and I had to mine each piece. And I blocked it off several times, but ended up having to do a lot of water draining and sponging to ensure that they didn't mix anymore. That's okay, that's done. Let's go collect diamonds and delete the world. We're near the very end of this now. It's taken hours and hours, but you can see the last layers of deep slate and tuff being blown away. I love seeing the bedrock emerge and the texture get darker in this little speed up. How satisfying is this? This is the first perimeter I've ever made with TNT dupers. I've hand dug one before, but that was in pre-118. And yes, I chose to make basically four standard perimeters as my quote unquote first perimeter. I have problems, we know this. My old worlds weren't full of TNT dupers and OP stuff, so I never had this chance, but since this world is pretty open to whatever I want to do to make it awesome, this has been a really fun learning experience to see how to set up the trenchers, the duper, and run the TNT machines. It's all been really cool. And back at home with our ores, you can see I got a ton of diamond ore out of this, over two and a half shulkers just from today. I'm no longer poor, let's go. And I needed a quick trip home at this point. I've been away for so many hours that we had shulkers and shulkers of honey backed up. Same with honeycomb. I refreshed my food, my rocket shulker, repaired all my gear, especially my wings. 
and the perimeter may be cleared out, but we're far from done. My next stop was the frog light farm. Just above all the bedrock, I want to fill the entire perimeter with frog lights so that the surface of my later artwork is completely lit at all times. I'm going to cover that up with carpet and slabs, but we're going to lay over 270,000 frog lights into the floor first. Getting 270,000 frog lights itself is no easy feat, but I collected, went back and collected more, and repeated this for hours. I decided the easy way to get all 160 shulkers moot was then to use leads on chess boats and fill the chess boats with shulkers or frog lights, and then I had a silly idea. Let's get a horse and ride this across the nether roof. All at once. After we get more frog lights, of course. I've now killed almost half a million magma cubes. Yes, I got these legitimately and myself, just in case you wondered. While flying around looking for a horse, I found something that some of you will remember. I found two of our really, really early game sniffers just randomly wandering. They are so far away from my starter pagoda where I let them out. They were both trapped, so I freed them and let them continue living their best lives, but it was really funny just seeing these guys. I thought they must have died 1500 days ago, but nope. They're just out here randomly roaming the wild and getting further and further from the base. Look where they are compared to my actual builds. Anyway, the horse hunt led me to this guy, and he pretty much loved me straight away. So we love him back. We flew back together so I could show him the city, and then I pillared up, remembering my armadillo adventure the entire time, and destined not to repeat that mistake. But no issues this time, and he flew straight into the portal, and now I have a horse on the nether roof. Unfortunately, we were only able to bring five of the six boats at one time. The sixth kept detaching no matter how I tried, so I decided to come back for that one. And we made it. That saved us five two-way boat trips. Did we save a lot of time doing this? Probably not, but it was funny. For the missing boat, I decided it would be easiest to set up as a boat on the ice path rather than dragging it back. This will make it a very quick trip, so I'll see you over there. Let me ask you a question. How would you move 160 full shulkers from one place to another very distant place? And once you got them there, how would you then move them down hundreds of blocks vertically without losing the contents? See, I have an idea, and it was a very scary idea. So I rode each boat through the portal, down this one wide dirt path that wasn't insane at all, and then simply rode off. At about halfway down, I would jump out, follow it, and then break the boat and simply move the shulkers a few blocks away to each of the chests. It's a very simple, if not sketchy, way to go. Once I had the technique down, though, I just had to repeat it five more times. And now we have 270,000 frog lights at the perimeter. And now I get the wonderful, incredible, not at all mind numbing, brain draining task of placing that many frog lights in straight lines for hours. At hours. At hours. There's not much to say here, but it's super cool to watch happen, so enjoy. When I needed breaks from the frog lights, which I did, I would simply go run my gravity block farm for concrete powder. We're going to use a lot of that to make simple walls for the perimeter, so I need to be here quite a lot, and it made for nice mental refreshes. And with this last row, you can see I've now placed over 94,000 of each type of frog light to go with my 212,000 sand placed. And this giant flashbang is the result. I haven't taken the world leader down yet because I wanted a flat floor to break onto. I wasn't going to sort through the different bedrock layers, but now that it's a flat, easy to walk on surface, collecting the parts as I break them is way, way easier. I only had one real mishap with that. Somehow I broke a coral fan before the TNT here. Uh, oops. 
Placing the concrete wall was a bit tedious. Look straight down, place three blocks, around and around in a 2000 plus block square. But I love seeing the progress on this. Watching the walls being completely covered and going from a very ugly, destroyed disaster of land to this smooth, simple surface is one of the great little pleasures this huge project offered me. Near the top is when I felt like this project was really starting to become something. Not finished, but closer than I could have imagined a few days or even a few episodes ago. Standing inside of it never looks as big as it actually is. With my normal 32 render distance, it's simply a box, and these smooth walls and overly bright floor that's still in light mode. So I thought I'd show you just a little taste of how huge this actually is using something you should all know from my world, the main storage. This is how large my main storage actually is when it's inside this perimeter. I use rockets to fly from one end of my storage to the other. This storage is big. This perimeter? It's massive. Let's catch up on a few of the statistics because they're actually interesting. I've placed over 257,000 light gray concrete powder, and it's our most placed block in the world. The top five blocks are all from this one project. To collect the carpets needed for this project would be nearly impossible normally. My 100 sheep wool farm makes around 9,000 wool per hour. I'd be sitting AFK at one farm for more than 24 hours straight to even get there. And we know I don't do that, so I built 10 separate carpet dupers and used the most rad collection ever, me, to collect it and store it all away. Thank you item scroller for this not being super toxic. And in these chests are every material I need to build the rest of the design. And yes, once again I'm using a Lightmatic file because I created this off an image many months ago and I want to get it exactly right. I'll be placing in the darkest colors first and no, I'm not going to do the typical Lightmatic thing and do it in boring rows. We're going to make it from the center out and you'll see why. Let me show you what I was so excited to build that I pushed aside our other plans. Okay, yes, I'm doing the outer light gray and boring lines, but only because I've been at this project for more than 100 hours in total. I'm worn out, I'm tired, my brain has turned off, you gotta forgive me. Oh, and look at this weird bug I picked up somewhere along the way. My feet don't move. I tried everything while in game to fix it, but only logging out and logging back in did the trick. I couldn't get into fly mode, swimming didn't work, it was so weird. I even tried taking damage. I'm just glad it also happened in a recent rec rap video, so I'm not the only one. Well, let's finish up. I have a big reveal to do, and with these blocks, I am done. It's now day 2829. You remember when I said to keep in mind the day earlier? That day was 2480. We've passed nearly 350 days in one episode, and it was all for this. This image is by an incredible graphic artist from Kazakhstan named Disk. I knew when I saw it I was gonna build it in game one day, and now we have. I love the way it works in the perimeter, and yes, I considered making it climb the walls and extend all the way out and up, but it was just too much for my brain to figure out. Now I can talk about the big four projects that will be inside this perimeter long term while we walk across the entire thing. And each project will basically cover one quarter of the full perimeter and be contained basically within a standard perimeter of its own. First, you already know if you've been watching, this area was chosen because of a double witch hut. I don't have any triples closer than 100,000 blocks, so I chose this double and I'm going to put a brand new, never before seen witch farm into one quarter of this perimeter. That witch hut will give us triple the redstone per hour of our old stacking raid farm, so we'll only be missing the emeralds from that now. All the rest of these plans are previously unannounced, so here we go. I'm putting a 600,000 per hour creeper gunpowder farm into one quarter of this perimeter. We've had four gunpowder sources in this world and frankly they all stake. I fly a lot and this will give us gunpowder for as long as I could ever want the world to continue and we will never have to upgrade it. Third, I'm going to make what I've been calling privately a tree complex. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to put a large bone meal farm here and that's going to power every type of tree farm. Universal tree farm, a nether tree farm, a mangrove farm, propagil farm, a fungi farm, a new dark oak farm that I want to try since we already have my 100k version in this world, and a series of bamboo farms that will produce a ton of bamboo whenever we need it. The bone meal farm will also power a charcoal farm because in the final quarter of the perimeter I'm going to build a 1728 furnace omega super smelter that smelts a shulker of material in about 10 seconds. Why? Because I can. Okay, no, honestly, what if I want to do a glass fog effect in this perimeter? A 7 layer glass fog would take nearly 2 million glass. We're not trading with librarians for that, so we have to get it somehow. I'm not saying I'll ever place 2 million glass for a single fog effect, but if I want to, I want to. And that's everything going in here. And can you believe I haven't even walked from one side to the other yet? In fact, I'm not even close. I'm barely at the middle. Hold on, let me zip right over there and find another couple of large builds to drop in here so you can see the true scale of this perimeter. 
This is the schematic for my starter pagoda. It's a six story high, rather decent sized build, and you can barely tell it's here without looking closely. How about this? I recently built this massive octagonal pagoda in my city that I called the biggest build I've ever done, and it is. But not here. Here it can't even cover the very center of the design. Before we go, I'm moving my dogs home so we can name them. You guys gave me loads of great suggestions last time, and I'm hoping those people see their pup's name now. Zeke wrote me a wonderful comment and said we're partial to the name Layla for a pup. I love that, so today we're naming one Layla. And Ariana asks, can you name the pupper Brave? Ariana leaves tons of lovely comments as well, and that's a perfect name, so we're going with that. You are going to be Layla, and you, you were the first new pup to approach me, so you're going to be Brave. Let's collect the rest of the new dog breeds soon, hmm? I think that's a good plan. I want to take one more long look at the finished project. Are you with me? 350 in-game days is somewhere between 75 and 120 hours of gameplay, no matter how you sleep or don't. I recorded over 110 hours of total footage for this one episode, so if you did like it, you know what to do. Please do the thing. This was a lot. Let's call it there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.